Um, good morning guys and welcome to this lecture. So today we're going to just be doing an overview of C Sharp and ASP.NET Core, the ASP.NET Core web framework. So in our last video we had an introduction to web development and I showed you how to create a controller, how to create an action, I showed you what URLs to enter in the browser to hit your action and how to display view. Um, then how to do some basic calculation and that really so what you can do now is you can always create a new project and you can add a view and add a controller action and get it to work but um, as you might have seen there are a lot of files there were a lot of files in that project that we did not touch at all and I would like to address them in this video so just go through them one by one and explain which what each of them does so you just kind of get like this broad um, overview of what things are doing all right so um first of all i would like to so i hear a lot of people ask questions like oh is c sharp a modern language should i be should i be learning c sharp now or c sharp is legacy and i just felt like i would take a few minutes to debunk that claim i have the tube index here so the tube index is like a ranking of programming languages so it ranks programming languages by their popularity, um, by the activity, by the um, usage and all of that. And this is a monthly ranking, right? So I have the tube ranking for May 2020 here. And we can see the list of programming languages. We have C Sharp at number five. So out of May 2019, in May 2019, it was actually at number six. But um, May 2020, it's up to number five, which is a good place to be at. So it's the only language ahead of it is C, Java, Python, and C++. Now, these are languages that existed a long, long time before C Sharp. So it's understandable that they have more popularity and they have more usage. But C Sharp coming in at number five, and we see from this arrow that it is actually increasing. So C Sharp's usage is increasing. Um, even today that people say oh no one does C sharp anymore and all of that so this is clearly not true according to this ranking and we see that C sharp ranks higher than JavaScript than PHP than Go and some other languages that you see people talk about today, like Ruby or Perl and you see that some of these languages are even um, decreasing in use and popularity so we see another Microsoft language made entry at number six Visual Basic. So Visual Basic used to be like the programming language for desktop applications. We see that a lot of people are still using Visual Basic, even though its use is declining now. And the reason the use is declining is because most um, Visual Basic developers are now coding in C Sharp. Um, we see JavaScript at number seven, and in May 20, 2019, it was at number seven, and it's still at number seven today. So it's really, even though there's a lot of rave and all of that, it, it really isn't doing so much more better than the other languages, if you look at it. So according to this stat, C Sharp is doing better than JavaScript, even though JavaScript has a lot of noise and a very loud community, if I may say. So that is one way to look at the growth of C Sharp. Another way would be to look at, let's look at the ASP.NET Core's website. And one way to measure the performance of a web development framework, like ASP.NET Core or like Node.js, is to really look at, okay, how many, what is the speed of this framework? How many requests can we process at a time? Now, what is a request? When you type in a URL in your browser and you hit enter, a message is sent to your browser that, hey, this person wants to view this page, right? That is a request. So you are making a request to your web server. Now imagine millions of people all over the world typing in www.google.com. They are making a request to Google's um, server. Now, one way to measure a web development framework um, performance is looking at how many requests can it handle in a second. How many requests can it handle in a second? So how, how many requests will it handle in a second before it starts having problems? or start having um, performance issues or slowing down or not responding to some of them. So here we see that Java, um, Java servlet apps can handle 2.5 million requests per second. That is a lot of requests. So if 2.5 million people are using um, a website or an API built with Java, 
it's not going to have any problems with that it can handle 2.5 million requests every second and then we look at node.js node.js can barely handle 1 million node.js is built on javascript and it can barely handle 1 million requests per second which is really 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 low now um now we look at .NET, which is ASP.NET Core, C Sharp, and the rest, and we see that it can handle 6.97 million requests per second, which far outshines these two. So if you're building an application that has to be highly available and performance is one of your main goals, C Sharp is one of the clear, .NET Core is one of the clear winners here. Um, it's modern, it has been rewritten for the modern web, and it, it's just blazing fast. So I just thought I would um, drop that in. And this is why you see a lot of corporates use .NET, even though the hippie developer community might not like .NET, but the truth is it gets the job done. And that is why people use it. It's secure, it's safe, it's performant, and come on, it's handling double the amount of requests any of these can handle um, per second. So really, why not .NET? So that said, I'm going to create a new web application and just go into it and kind of just show you all the parts of it. So at .NET new MVC, I'll give it a name, I'll call it demo web application. So .NET new MVC and demo web application I'll hit enter and wait for it to restore the nugget packages and create the project and all of that all right great we see that it's ready so I'll just go cd demo web application I'll hit enter and then I'll say code dot to open it in Visual Studio Code. I'm going to my window um, a little bigger. I hope this is big enough. And we're just going to start with these files, right? We're going to start from the lowest. So and just go upwards from there and look at each of the folders and each of the files and just really think about what each of them are doing, what their role is in the whole of this thing. But before we do that, let's just run this application and make sure that it runs. So I'm going to type .NET to run and hopefully it's going to run. I'm going to see it in my browser. Okay, we see the application has started and it started on port 5000. So we have two URLs, one on port 5001 and one on port 5000. While we're here, I would just like to mention the reason you have two URLs is one has an S, so HTTPS, and one doesn't have an S, which is HTTP. The difference being that the one with an S is secure. So any information you send on a site that uses HTTPS, the chances that that information can be intercepted and stolen by an attacker is very minimal. So that is why when you see sites that require you to enter your card details or your personal information or your address, those sites have to be using SSL, which gives them the HTTPS URL. And then what happens when you enter your details into that site is then it takes those your details and it encrypts them in a format that even if someone steals those details, it's of no use to them because it's basically scrambled. It's garbage, right? So only when it has hit the other side of the connection, that it has hit the application server, is it converted from that random string back to the actual representation. But when you send information over normal HTTP, what happens is the information is sent 
exactly in the format that you sent it so there's no encryption there's no randomization nothing so if someone say someone on the same connection with you maybe on your same wi-fi or on your same office network can actually intercept that connection you're making to the web server before it gets to the web server and steal your information so that's the difference between http and https so now we'll just continue we'll continue using the http url because we're really not doing anything super secure and when it's time for ssl we're going to learn about it i'm going to come to my browser and enter my url and i see that my application is running so that's all i wanted to make sure of i'm not going to we're not going to make any change to this application the goal here is just to go to the application bit by bit and see what each part does now let's start from the last one here startup.cs now startup.cs like the name implies it's one of the core components of our web application it's where a lot of configuration happens it is where we tell our application how to behave basically so when we we enter a url in our browser right so we enter localhost slash index slash our uh, uh, local host slash home slash index and we hit enter and it goes to um a controller how does our application know to send this to that controller that happens in startup.cs so we use startup.cs to configure our web application for example there's a there's a, there's a method here called configure services the things called services in our mobile in our web application which we're going to talk about later but the start of the series allows us to configure these services and then there's another method called configure so you begin to see that most of the things in startup.cs is really configuration so we're telling it hey this is how our application should act or this is what our application should do now I'm going to come down here now if you notice i'm going to run this application again and i need you guys to pay attention here i'll say dot net run and i'll just let that boot up and i'm going to come here and i'm just going to say i'm going to navigate to https localhost 5001 i'm not going to specify a controller name and i'm not going to specify an action name i'm going to hit enter and if you notice what happened i get my home controller so this is i get my home controller and the index action back index action that's what i get back here but i didn't tell it to go to slash home slash index right but if i hit this i still get the same page so either using it like this or using it with the slash home slash index work and why is that this happens because in our startup.cs we've configured it that if a person doesn't specify a controller path or an action path the default controller will be home and the default action will be index now we're specifying it on this line we're saying if the person enters just our application's root url which is localhost 5000 and they don't specify the controller they want to go to or the action they want to go to use the home controller as a default and index as the what's it called and index as the default action to show that this works i'm going to add a new controller here so i'll say new file um i'll say i'll call it arithmetic controller um we need to complete that arithmetic controller.cs and i'll come here and i'll create a namespace namespace demo web application dot controllers and then i'll go public class um Arithmetic controller just like we've done a thousand times. Public class arithmetic controller. It's going to inherit from controller and then I'm just going to um I, I need a using statement here. 
I'm just going to take the using statements from here. I'm not going to use all of them, but I'll just take all of them and paste them here. All right? It should be controller, not controllers. Okay, so I've created an arithmetic controller. I'm going to create an action here and say public um i action result so here you can use either an action result or an i action result like i like i explained on the channel so public i action result um i'm going to call this um quadratic right so um as you mean that this quadratic i can't spell quadratic so i'm um, assuming that this action is going to return a view for us to calculate the quadratic equation so return view so i've created my um i've created my controller i've created my action the next thing i need to do is i need to create the corresponding view right so i'll come in here and i'll say new folder now remember the name of my folder needs to match the name of the controller so the controller i created was arithmetic controller so I'll create a view folder called arithmetic and within that folder I'm going to create a view so I'm going to say new file and I'm going to say quadratic.cshtml awesome um, because I don't want to waste a lot of time I'm simply going to take the code from the home controller from the index controller and I'll paste it and quadratic i'll change the title to, to quadratic calculator all right so um i'm going to create a form and some input boxes so for h1 i'm going to see enter the variables for the quadratic equation and then i'm going to create a form sp controller should be arithmetic um action should be Quadratic. Mm. And now I can create my input element, right? So I'll say input um, is holder equals enter value for a because in a quadratic equation we know we have three variables, right? A, B, and C. So enter value for a. I'm going to make this required and then I'm going to make the type to be a number because we're expecting the person to enter a number here. I'm going to duplicate this. So I'll copy this. So I'll say enter value for B and then I'll say enter value for C. So there I'm taking all the variables from my quadratic equation. Awesome. So what's left is a submit button. I'm going to say button um, type equals submit um, then calculate. So there. Um, I have my view and what's going to happen is I'm going to run this application so first of all I'll stop this I'll clear my console then I'll go dot net run right and I'm going to stop this so I have a typo here enter the variables so this should be variables I'll save it so I'll clear this yeah, and then dot net one 
let's just give it a second all right great so i'll go back to my browser and i'll hit here and i see i still have my home page but what if i go to slash arithmetic slash quadratic hmm. okay i think i Mm, just made a mistake here. SP, I think this should be SP action. Okay, so the net one. Alright, so let's try this again. Alright, awesome. So I have my um quadratic calculator showing. So I say enter a variable for A. Um, enter a value for B, enter a value for C, and then calculate. Well, if we enter values now, um, we're just going to have the same page presented to us because, or we're going to have, get an error because we don't have a post controller yet. So if you remember, when you want to um, get values back, you need to have a post controller. So all we have right now is the get controller. But we're not even going to do that now because that's not what we're focusing on. So I have this quadratic um, calculator, right? But if I come to the root of my application without any slash home or slash index or slash arithmetic, what I see is my home page. Now, what if I want my quadratic page to be the first page you see when you come here without having to add slash arithmetic? I want it to be the main page of my application because at the end of the day, that is my main page. Remember the thing I told you about startup being the place where you can configure your application from? We're going to come here. So in our startup, in this app to use endpoint, we can tell our application what the default page it should go to is. And the way to do that, I'm going to change the home here. And I'm going to change it to arithmetic. And I'll change the action it's supposed to go to to quadratic right so right now now instead of going to slash home slash index i'm going to arithmetic quadratic which is arithmetic and then quadratic right um so just once again see where i'm doing it i'm doing it in my startup class and then i'm going to stop the application then clear dot next one Okay. and hopefully this will work now this time when i come to my application and i come to the base i see i no longer get the home page i'm getting my quadratic calculation page on the root and that is how to specify which um controller and which almost called which controller and which action should be the default one when you navigate to the application without any url so um, that is one of the things you can do in the startup class. It's just um, The startup class is very powerful. It's one of the most powerful parts of the application, but that is one of the things you can do Here and another thing that is happening here is when we have an error in our application For example, an exception is thrown or a view is not there. For example, I'm going to comment out this action Um Oh, where's my shortcut? Okay, you know, I'm just going to use the multi-line comment here. So, so this is, by the way, this is a multi-line comment if you've never used it before. So I'm just going to comment on my quadratic equation here. My quadratic, because I want the application to do an error. So I'm going to say dot net run. and awesome now i'm going to come here and try to navigate to the same page and this time i get an error oh you know what let's this is not the kind of error i was hoping to show um let's just leave this here so i'll uncomment this and i'll simply come here and delete this right so i'll delete the view I just deleted the view because I wanted to do an actual exception. Just 
So I will dot net run again. And let's come back here and see enter. And what we're seeing is we're seeing an accept an error here, and we're expecting this error because it's telling us hey, we can't find the view quadratic. So it's saying okay, we can see the action and we can see the controller, but there's no view, so we don't know what to display, right? And now I want to explain why we can see this error. Now, when you actually deploy your application for users to use, you don't want them to see details like this. So these details are personal to the developer. The user of your application does not need to know what went wrong with your application. So all you should tell them is, hey, something went wrong, but we're investigating it. They don't need to know that a view was not found because that is too much information it can tell an attacker things about your application that will help them attack your application but um, in our startup class we are saying hey if we're working on a development environment display the exception page so our application can tell or rather we can configure our application to know that okay we are still working on this application like this application is still under active development and we can configure it to tell it okay this application is in production like people have actually started using this web application so what we're saying here is if the application is in development so if this is a development environment if we're working on this application currently then use the exception page make it possible that these kind of detailed error pages will be displayed because then when something goes wrong we need to know what goes wrong as developers so that we can fix it but if it is not a development page so if a current if, a, if it is a user using our website you don't need to see all these details and so we don't enable it here so when an actual user is using our application and he runs into a problem like this all they're going to see is we're well, sorry an error occurred please try again and they don't see these detailed error pages and we are doing it here in this configure and these are some of the things you can do with um asp.net core so if we when we start talking about databases we're going to configure our database from here and our application knows okay this is the database we're using when we start using users we're going to configure our users um authentication bits from here now, okay um we can't okay if a user does not have this value he can't log in or all of that all of that is going to happen in the startup file so just so you know the startup file is just like the central configuration place for your application that you can come and configure things configure how you expect the application to behave configure what endpoint at the default endpoint you see here we have something like app that use authorization it's saying okay um x and y parts of this application needs to be protected and someone has to be signed in before they can access it and we're going to get to all of that so that is kind of what the startup class does right um so very quickly i'm just going to go and recover the file i deleted so i'll just restore it for my recycle bin great now moving on um we spent quite a lot of time on the startup class moving on to the program.cs class so the program.cs class it actually allows us to configure our application so it's a configure um but it's a different kind of configuration remember every c -sharp program has a main method um i mentioned that in one of our earlier earliest samples LS videos and this is the main method for your application when you start your application this is actually the first piece of code that is called when you start your web application so when you say .NET run it looks for this function called main and this is where your application starts execution from and what you see here is create web host builder blah 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 you don't have to worry about all of this yet but the important part is we're saying web builder dot use startup and we're passing that startup file remember the startup file configures contains all the configuration of how we want our application to behave so we have an use startup file and we're saying hey immediately the application comes up use the startup file and use all the configuration from there to create our websites that starts 
and then this is a CS page file. So even in our console application, we had a CS page file, and all the CS page file does is it tells um, the .NET Core framework what kind of application we're using. So what what we're building here. So according to this CS page file, we're building a Microsoft .NET .SDK .Web application, and it says we're using the not .NET Core um, version 3.1. The different versions of .NET Core, it says here we're using the 3.1 version and um, generally you wouldn't have to worry about this um, file too much, at least for now. Um, we're going to move on now to AppSettings.json. So AppSettings.json basically allows us to put configuration settings that we're going to use later in our program. So for example, um, you need to connect to a database or you need an ad you need somewhere to save an admin password or you need somewhere just to save a key or access token or things like that. So basically you put things like that here. We're not using a database, right? I'm going to assume we're using a database and I'm going to just say database connection string. And I'm going to type some connection string, right? And what, what I'm doing here is um, this is obviously not a connection string, but this is the format that um, this application uses. And I, I can put an actual connection string to a database here. And when my application needs to talk to a database, I just say, hey, application, do you remember the value I saved as database connection string? And it's going to say yes. And I'm going to say, okay, give me that value. I'm going to use this name to say, give me the value of the connection string. And then it's going to give me this connection string. Now, one reason to use um, these settings files or this JSON file is that because we're putting our application into GitHub, sometimes we don't want certain information to go to GitHub, right? Now, as you we're working with um, a, a GitHub repository that is not private, a public GitHub repository, right? And we have passwords to certain services that we're using. Maybe we're sending emails with um, our application so we have our gmail password here we don't want everyone to see our gmail password so we put that information in this app settings file and we exclude this file from github so we have a way to exclude this file so every time we push to github this particular file is not pushed because then we, we don't want people to see our personal and that is what the configuration file does there's another one called app settings.development.json so you can have identical values now, you can have identical values in both of them, but then going back to what I said about environment and being able to show error screen to some people, to you as a developer and not showing those error screens to other people, it's basically the same thing. So I can have this same database connection string in my app settings.development.json. And what happens when I run this application as a developer is that it's going to use um, I'm going to use some developer connection string. It's not going to use the same database that my users are using because I don't want to tamper with that database. I, I might be working against it and I'll mistakenly delete some data, which is terrible. So what I'm, what I'm doing here is I'm saying, hey, whenever I am running this application as a developer or in development mode, I'm still using the same database connection string, but when I ask for the database connection string, don't give me the one to my live database, to the one with my actual users. Give me the development database I have set up for testing. So then I am not messing with people's data. And so that is the difference between these two files. We kind of any we can put the same values in both of them, but the value of these configuration parameters are going to differ between what we're using in our development environment and what we're using in other places. Now I'm going to close up some of these files to reduce the clutter and we can continue. So we have a WW root folder here and a lot of you have been asking, oh, how do I style my application? Where's the CSS? Where's the JavaScript? Where's the HTML? And all of that resides in the WW root folder. And we have a CSS folder and the site.css. Now most of us know what CSS is. CSS is used for styling styling our application. And if you feel like the site doesn't look good and you'd like to use your own CSS, all you have to do is simply come in here and 
add your CSS basically define your own CSS and use it in your application now for JavaScript same thing you just come in here and currently there's no JavaScript on our site or if you want some cool JavaScript to do some animation and all of that you come in here and you add your JavaScript and then there's this live lib folder we're using bootstrap now so um the bootstrap lives in this lib folder we're using jquery um if you don't understand what all of this is you really don't have to worry about it as a backend developer or you don't have to worry too much about it rather or these are just really css and javascript files which can make the front end of our application look um better so that's we've covered the WW root. We, we can have a folder called images here in our WW root folder, which is going to hold images we're going to use in our application and all of that. And that brings us to the views folder, right? In our views folder, we already know what the view folder is. The view folder holds views that are actually rendered in our application. And the view folder is broken into folders, which correspond to controller names. So we have the arithmetic for the arithmetic controller. We have the home for the home controller and then we have this one shared we've really never talked about the shared so what is the shared i'll show you something um uh, the application is stopped now i'm going to run the application uh, and i want to show you something .net run. Okay, our application is running now. I'm going to navigate to our application and I'm going to come to our quadratic view. And if you noticed, all we've defined in our quadratic view is enter the variables for the quadratic equation and then we have our form. But then when we come here, we see that we have a header, we have a footer. Um, so we have a header which says demo web application. We have home, we have privacy, and then we have a footer which says C2020 and all of this. Now, where is all of this coming from? This is they're not in our view. We haven't displayed. These are the only these are the only things we've created in our view. This label or this text and these text boxes. So where is all of this? This cool navigation bar. Where is all of this coming from? And the thing is they're coming from this shared folder right and when you're building an application there's certain parts of your view that you're going to reuse for example let's see what um facebook.com looks like I, I hope this is a good example okay so um this is my facebook page right and this is the header Right, this part that's showing my name and showing search Facebook. And if I click on my groups, we see that I still have my header here, right? And if I click, click on this, so it doesn't matter what page I navigate to, I need to have this header. Same thing in my application. So whether I navigate to home or I navigate to privacy, I still have my header. And we can define this header inside of each our each of our view page so i could define this header here and then i'll go to the home page and define the header or because i know that this header is going to be used across multiple pages i can put it in a special kind of file called a layout file so the layout file defines the skeleton of the application so the layout file defines the top of the application and the bottom of the application and then your view file just defines what is going to be in between and that's what we're doing here so i i have my layout file here and it's pretty large and then we can see demo application here and we're finally seeing where this demo application is coming from on the on the title and then we're going to scroll down if you've done any um html we see that we have a nav bar and you don't have to worry about all of this so much if you don't understand what it is but we have a nav bar here and on our nav bar we have demo application demo web application and that is what we have here that is what we have here demo web application and then we have home and we have privacy which are links so these are links that can take us to other pages and that's it here home privacy and then 
we now have something called this is a very special bit of code called render body and we're going to come back to it but let's look at the bottom so at the bottom we have c this actually um, turns into the c symbol with a circle around it 2020 demo web application so we have it down here and we're saying c2020 demo web application and so this class this um view underscore layout of html in our shared folder is basically saying hey this is what a page is going to look like the header and the footer and the truth is we can create a sidebar too that all our pages are going to have and then this render body then says okay this is the layout now take whatever view is defined by the independent view and put it within this layout and so this is what this render body does it is this render body that is responsible for taking this code that we defined so what the render body does is it takes this code and it puts it within this layout or between this layout and that is why when we navigate to home flash privacy what it actually does is it constructs the page so it takes the layout file and it takes whatever code is coming from our view that we're going to at the moment and it just kind of puts it between the layout file and in that way we can then we share we, we can share this html um so let's say we need another hyperlink so currently we have the home and the privacy let's say we want people to be able to be navigate to our calculator page let's just add another link here i'm going to leave so it's saying hey um the controller it's going to is the home controller i'm going to change from home controller to arithmetic so I'm, I'm going to say i want this to go to the arithmetic controller and i want this to go to the quadratic action quadratic action right and then I'm going to say oh, the text I want it to display. I want it to display quadratic calculator, right? And then I'm going to open up my terminal. I'll stop the application running, and I'll say dot net one. Okay, so our application is running. So I'm just going to come back here and now if you notice at the top i have home privacy and then quadratic calculator now and no matter what page i go to quadratic calculator is always going to be at the top because that layout file is shared if i go to privacy i see that i have quadratic calculator there i can click on quadratic calculator to come here if i click on it again i'm going to navigate to the same page and that really is how um this works right so that is what is shared so if when you have html that you want to be shared um, across multiple page for example you might want to show something like log out or log in up here that's going to show on all the pages your layout page is the path is a place for all of that and so that is what the shared folder does um there's view start view import we're going to um, just um, leave all of this for now. What's important here is the layout page. So that is what the layout page does. If you've been wondering where this extra markup that we didn't define come from, it comes from the layout page and you can change it. And you also apply your style sheets from the layout page. Now see the HTML, the CSS is actually imported here. So if you've done some HTML and you're familiar with um, CSS, we're actually importing the CSS in our layout file because then it's going to be available to all other pages. We are importing our bootstrap from our layout file. And um, that starts with that. So we already know what this, so that starts with a view folder. I'm going to close all of this and then we have the properties folder you're not going to be working too much with this but sometimes you want to change the ports your application runs on so currently when we start our application our application starts on port 5001 and port 5000 and why does it start on this port Th those ports are not special right it, it can as well have started on any port but when you create a new project um asp.net generates a project template for you and it uses this port as a default template 
Now the truth is your system has 65,000 unique ports. So these numbers can be whatever you want them to be. And if you feel like you need to change the port, maybe you already have an application running on a certain port on your system and you want to use a different port for this app, you simply come in here. I'm going to change this port to 4000 or 4030 and I'll change the HTTP one to 6745, it doesn't matter. And then I'm going to run this application. So I'll say Ctrl C, clear .net run. And let's see what happens here. Now this time your application is started on port six five four three and port forty thirty, right? So I'm going to take this URL and confirm that I can still hit my application. And there, it still works everything still works and, and now the port i'm hitting is port 4030 so if you ever feel like um if you ever feel like you need to change the ports your application is running on you simply have to come in here now remember that thing i told you about the environment currently when you hit .NET run it sets your environment to develop development so your application runs in development mode that is why you see um, what's it called you see those detailed error messages when you're done um working on your application and you need to deploy your application to, to maybe a server or a web host and you don't want those detailed errors to show all you have to do is change development to production and suddenly it doesn't use your connection strings from the development settings it doesn't use it doesn't display those detailed error messages if something wrong happens it just says hey something happened um can you please try again in a few minutes so that is where you change the environment and that's and th there's a lot of things you can do with the launch settings um file but this is some of the most common and this is what is important for you to know now and that's that the object folder is really a folder that is generated when we um, run our application and we really don't need to talk so much um, about it now so we're just going to ignore it then we have a models folder we're going to so um, I mentioned that MVC which is what we're doing here is model view controller we've seen our view we've seen our controller we still haven't really talked about models we're going to come back to that and then the controller folder so we've worked a lot with controllers and we know what goes in the controller folder we know about what happens with actions and how they return views and that's that and then the bin folder is an auto generated folder too and it really so we, we don't have to talk about this now it's generated when you run your project you really have to work with it so we can just ignore it now and that really is just a run through of the different parts of an ASP.NET Core web application. If you don't get this on first try, I beg you to finish this video, then run it again, and actually listen to each of, go to each of the steps, listen to what um, different files do, and um, how they do it, and it's basically going to make you a better developer. So when things are not working, you know which part of your application to go to, to fix that stuff. If you try to run your application and it tells you oh this port is already taken or oh i can't bind to this port you know that all you have to do is to go to your properties and your launch settings and change the ports you're using because the truth is that there are a lot of um application running on your system at any given time and any of them can bind to any ports so um, So any of them combined to um, any port at any particular time. Uh, I, I can't remember what command shows which application is using a port at any specific time. There's a command for it. Um, I'll just Google it real fast. Check um, assigned port windows. Okay, yeah. So next that's n. Uh, so I'm going to clear this and I'll go next start hyphen n. 
and I see that um, there are different applications running on different ports on my system. So there's an application running on port 1928, there's one running on port 1996. And so let's see what's going to happen. I'm going to come here and say um, I want to run an application, my application on port 2768 because I know it has been used. 2768. I'll save, then I'll say net run mm, yeah, so it actually runs I was supposed to get an error here mm, actually works oh um let's try one of these so it says this is actually closed let's try one nine two eight So I'm saying here, I want you to start this application on port 928, I'll clear and say .NET run. Okay, so look, it's, it, it has given me an error now, unable to bind to port 1928. So it says unable, so it's in here, I can't bind to these ports and the reason it's um getting this error is because something else is using that port i don't know what but at any point in time a lot of things are running on your system and they're using different ports and so when you get this kind of um error you know that what you need to do is to come in here and so let's stop the application and change the ports i am running on i'm going to say i want to run on ports it's and then i'm going to go dot nail on again Oh, this is an invalid port. So remember, I said sixty-five thousand. That's the that's the number of ports you have. So from I, I think zero to sixty-nine thousand. Also, now my application has started on port six eight zero nine. I just want to come back here. I'll clear this and I'll run the command again. Let's start in. And let's see if we can find our application. Mm. No, we, we can't find our application here. What's the port again? 680. Okay, now we, we can't find the application here. I'm, I, I can't remember how to get all the network interfaces on your system. But that just kind of solves the problem so you know okay if i can find if i can't latch to a particular port i just have to change the ports in my log settings to json the json and that's kind of what um, i hope to achieve with this video so yeah that's it if you noticed i started a quadratic calculator in this project so in our next video we're just going to complete the calculator so the aim is um so given a quadratic formula we should be able to enter in our variables a b and c and actually solve that quadratic um formula and give a person an answer and we're going to do that in the next um video see you guys thanks for watching and have a good weekend